All right. I'll call the council meeting today to order. And we won't excuse Wayne. He is planning to get here. He said he just would be late. So the adoption of last minutes are on the agenda first. Any concerns or could we get a motion to adopt? And remove the adoption. All in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Uh, are there any post agenda items? Kelly. I believe we have intergovernmental in camera, please. Any other items to add? If not, could we have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? Clarence moves, all in favor? Opposed, motion is not carried. We are at question period, so I'll just pause for a moment. Um, You guys are always curious, uh, you know, how many people we have watching. I think uh, from my numbers here, we have 13 people viewing online today. I know one of those is Morgan because she helped me troubleshoot earlier. Um, but the other 12 is a mystery. So uh, welcome to those 12. And yeah, if there's ever any questions that can always be typed in and I can see them and ask at any time. Thanks, Todd. We will proceed on to uh, Devon's item, which is the bylaw, Boating Safety in Aquatic Invasive Species. Welcome, Devon. Good morning. Um, yeah, after last boating season, the Eastern Irrigation District and myself and John, we reviewed the uh, last year's bylaw so now we propose a new one just for some updated changes uh not too much just more of an improvement on some sections but one was to add a, a severability clause uh with a duplication of the definition decal and we just updated the um or changed some wording for the definition of trailer watercraft as well as a wording change again for section four and then we expanded on section six just um for that one, the idea we're thinking about doing either a mirror uh, decal or something to put in the dash just for when boats at Kimbrook Island go early, we can still identify if they're part of our program or not. Um, and that's pretty much it for the changes for that bylaw. And we just uh, recommend for council to proceed with the first reading of the new bylaw, which would be 2001-21. Thank you. Questions for Devin? Or... Someone want to make a motion for first reading? Tracy. You're making a motion for first reading, Tracy? Yes, all right. All in favor Are you? of first reading? All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Did I, I didn't miss any questions there, did I? No, oh, all good. Well, thanks, Devin. Um, we'll be uh, hearing from you again for second and third reading, obviously, in a while. Absolutely, thank you. You bet. So, uh, tax penalties is our next one. Is Shannon with us? I hope she's with us because I don't want her against us. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Away you go, Sean. Um, okay, so 
the incentives and penalty uh, bylaw. We had changed it last year um, and offered that uh, 8% discount on the municipal taxes, um, bumped the first penalty into the seventh and lowered both that one and the March penalty. Uh, this year, we're proposing uh, adjusting the municipal discount to 2.5% and then reverting the other two penalties back to what they were pre pre-COVID, uh, 8% in November and 12% in March. Um, I don't know what else to add. The, uh, everyone I talked to really enjoyed the discount and thought that was awesome. Um, the program was a little bit um, learning curve, getting it off the ground, but I know what I'm doing this year and it'll be a lot easier. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's about all I have. <laughs> oh, sorry. And I only want, I'm only requesting first reading um, so that we can uh, put it out to the public if there's any other feedback. And then I'll come back and ask for second and third. Questions, anyone? Brian. Um, just on your options there, you have option one, which is uh, uh, incentives and penalties of tax on taxes as presented. And the number two is, is as amended. Can you maybe do? define a little bit what that means for me. I, I support what your proposed changes are. Do they reflect option one or option two? Um, option one. Um, option two would be, I guess, if you didn't like the numbers I had uh, I had uh, presented, you could edit that and then come back if you wanted to adjust the penalty differently. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Kelly? Motion to approve option one. Okay, for first reading of option one. Any further questions, discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Hubie, did you have a question? I uh, know I was going to make the motion, Molly. Thanks. Can't hear you, Molly. Okay, uh, first reading has been approved then, and uh, we will be hearing more. Or no. Yeah, this is the first reading, correct? Shannon or not? Yeah, just first reading, please. I'll come back for the second and third. Okay. That's all for today then, Shannon? Um, I do have one other one, um, the review board clerk one, but I can come back later too. Oh, you can, you may as well do it now if you want. Sure, that'd be great. What item is that? And one one. Ten point one. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Page two. Um, ten point one. Go ahead. Thank you. The um. So in addition to our regional board for members for hearing uh, assessment appeals, we are doing a regional clerk pool so that if any other municipalities have any appeals, uh, we can handle that. Currently, I'm trained for the county and I think there's two, uh, they're in here, two from the city that have the training. You have to be trained in order to operate as the clerk for that. Um, but any of the other municipalities, I don't believe they have anyone with the training. So if they were to receive uh, an appeal, uh, we would have to do it. So, and according to the MGA, uh, the clerks need to be named. So I'm just looking for, what am I looking for? A motion that um, I'm approved and the two people from the city, uh, Kathy and Amy, are, uh, are appointed as the clerks for the pool. Thank you. Questions? Anne-Marie? I'll make that motion to approve. Thank you. Seeing no other hands up, all in favor? 
Motion is carried. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, everyone. Brian, you had a question? Well, I just go want to go back to that other one we have in front of us, the three readings with the uh, course for consent. I'm just wondering what's, is there a reason we can't do all three readings or does this have to go to the public in order to be passed for the tax penalties and incentives? Um. What, what do we uh, usually do, I guess? Or what, what is uh, somebody there, Matt, or someone else that can fill us in on this? Hi, Matt. Got it. We're talking about item 721. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything preventing council from uh, doing the three readings. I think we typically like to uh, give the public a chance to comment on, on these things just as a best practice. But uh, if council wants to um, move with move forward with all three readings, you can uh, certainly do that. Clarence? Before I let the public know, I think it's good procedure and uh, pretty painless and just if they would want if there's a desire to be involved there the opportunity is there I hate to be accused of not giving that opportunity any other comments It confuses us when we have choices like this on the on the agenda. <laughs> All right, we will uh, uh, proceed. And I know I'm just trying to keep in mind today our next um, delegation is at 11 and then 1130. So we will go on. Todd, did you want to do your report? Does that fit in for you right now? I am at your disposal. Perfect. Just have to open it. All right. So I do apologize. I was reading this last night and it was a uh, not a linguistic masterpiece. It's very choppy, full of great information, I must say, but uh, not the greatest writing. Um, so, yeah, just quickly, I think uh, we've talked about gophers pretty much. Uh, well, just a lot since uh, kind of start of February, and we did uh, we got 50% of our 2% strychnine order in. Uh, just recently, we received another 20% of that order, so we have divvied out quite a bit of it. Uh, just waiting on some people to come back and get the rest of their orders. Uh, we've also been working in a few of our hamlets: uh, Lake New Resort, Rolling Hills, Patricia ro uh, at the rodeo grounds. Um, I know. Uh, Will was just making some arrangements to help out the uh, town of, Bizan uh, of Duchess, pardon me. And uh, we also go out to the Bizano uh, airport and help them out with some Rosal baiting. So anyways, we've talked about gophers a lot. Uh, I'm sure we've talked about them a lot here, uh, but excited that we're, we're starting to get some control work done. So we did have some rentals already. Uh, one of our drills is actually out right now, uh, seeding some grass seed in some dry corners. So hoping that landowner got that done. Um, yeah, in terms of returning staff, uh, we have quite a few, but we do have six newbies, uh, if, if we can call them that, coming on. Uh, so we spent a, always this time of year, we spend a fair amount of time just making sure our standard operating procedures and the JHAs and all the safety uh, stuff is ready for when they get here. Um, so that's the second part there. We're excited that Chris is gonna be back helping us at Emerson Bridge Park again. Uh, she, we feel she does such a great job and we know it's going to be a busy year uh, because we have been fielding so many calls. I think uh, last time I checked with Will, we have eight of our uh, seasonal spots uh, counted for now. Uh, sorry, they're all booked and paid for. So that's exciting for us. And then lots of people uh, that are just trying to book, uh, especially when they're from outside of our area. 
And uh, when we tell them they can't book a site, they uh, sometimes can be a little bit aggravated. But when we remind them that the county ratepayers still put in a little bit of money to this park that isn't uh, recuperated through the use, so they get the first shot, um, they, they seem to understand that pretty quickly. So uh, we are still helping a few uh, producers through the environmental farm plan, farm plan process. Uh, with Catherine leaving, she is our environmental farm plan uh, person. So she's going to uh, take on a little bit of an extra role teaching me how to do it, which I haven't uh, learned it yet, but I've been through it myself. It's not a, a ridiculously hard process. It's just a lot of information to enter about your operation. Uh, what else we got here? The ASB grant. Yeah, excited to say, you know, last uh, last year we were thinking we were going to get our um, environmental funding portion of the ASB grant. I'm happy to note that we just signed and got the application back um, for an extension of that grant and we did get that $18,000. So that helps to pay for uh, things that we do on the environmental side. So if we had to go out and do any environmental farm plans, cap grants type stuff, uh, some producers have asked us to do riparian area assessments, those kinds of things. Uh, that's kind of what that grant helps to cover. And then just on a side note, uh, we've been really trying to work together with municipal services as hard as Mark and Terry and Jeff were to get along with. Um, just trying to take a whole right of way approach when it comes to some of the uh, construction projects they have planned. Uh, it's in areas that we currently do some work. Um, so we wanna make sure that, you know, drainage isn't the only thing we're thinking about. We're thinking about some of the maintenance activities afterwards as well. And then we are going to, uh, work with them again to put some fencing up. So excited to uh, get some of these projects going with this great weather. And lastly, I think, uh, yeah, keep your eyes on the social media pages. Uh, if council isn't following us already and anybody else that's listening out there, I think we have some great information. Uh, and Catherine and Jolene have put some wonderful Weed Wednesday programming um, in place. So we should see that rolling pretty soon. So. And that's about what I have to tell you today. Thank you, Todd, and welcome, Wayne. Any questions for Todd? Anyone? Hubie. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Todd, did you have any indications of last year in 2020 of um, in the area at all? Sorry, you kind of broke up with me a little bit there, Hubie. What, uh, can you repeat that? Were there any indications of phragmites in uh, the county last year, 2020? Oh yeah, my favorite phragmites. No, um, yeah. we actually were very lucky. I think again, um, we still only have the three sites that we've been monitoring um, and we haven't found any anywhere else. Um, so, you know, cross your fingers. I think uh, we have that one lit or at least we did in 2020 and uh, hopefully going forward as well. Okay, good. I should have said I had two questions. The second question, is there still a plan for more hawk nests this year? You know, that was such a great idea and I, and I really do, um, I think it is a great idea to add hawk nests to the landscape. Uh, we just didn't get the feedback that we wanted from individual producers for us to supply them. Uh, so we put them up where we could on, on county property where it would work and kind of follow the guidelines. And, and I think there's always opportunity for guys to do it themselves or, or guys or girls or ladies to do it themselves. Um, we just haven't had any requests for us to help out with that. Okay, thanks, Todd. Any other questions? If not, oh, Clarence. Todd, you, you mentioned Catherine leaving. Um, are we looking for a replacement or what's what's the story there? Uh, we talked about it at a fair bit of length around our table, Clarence, and we, uh, we did not hire a full-time uh, replacement for Catherine. Um, the thing that we think we can get away with uh, is just hiring one extra vegetation management technician, which will be a, that's a seasonal position. And because a lot of what the uh, 
Catherine spends a lot of time doing the work um, and, and kudos to her for that. Uh, so in the summertime, we're just gonna spread out her administrative duties kind of through Will and Joe and myself. And then the actual work portion, uh, you know, in the field, doing the spraying, making sure that we're finding the weeds. Uh, we're gonna rely fairly heavily on some of our returning vegetation management technicians or, or weed inspectors, I guess, according to the act. So we think that's the best way to go. I might have a different opinion in June, but uh... it's worth a try. Thanks, Todd. Yep. Any other questions? Could we get a motion to accept Todd's report, please? Ellen moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, I'm wondering if we have our solar craft guys on line yet. It's early. Just thought I would check. Okay, we will uh, carry on to item 10-3. So, sorry, oh. Molly, there, there is a mark on. Uh, well, yeah. There's two Mark Harbick with us, but there's also another mark and I'm not yes. sure if uh, he's from Silvercraft. He is. Oh. Mark uh, Burgett and Jeff Thachuk. And I don't know if, uh, so you see Mark on. We'll wait, we'll wait a bit and see if Jeff also joins. And so in the meantime, we'll just go to item 10, Three, the invitation to an, attend and vote at the AGM for Genesis Reciprocal. So I'm assuming that this is a um, online meeting and this is the one that we used to force Kevin to attend, I believe. So guess what, Matt? <laughs> um, is that something, Matt, that you had in your plan for April 8th? It's in the calendar. <laughs> Perfect. Do we need a motion to do that? Or that's just uh, just covered? Uh, Brian? I believe we need a motion for him to have the, vi the voting ability um, from council. So, and I would be happy to make that motion. It's part of your penance for taking this job because I've attended those meetings and it's like watching paint dry, but I'm not a numbers guy like you are. So congratulations, you've, uh, you've reached a new level. <laughs> All right, Brian has made a motion to um, appoint uh, Matt to attend and vote at the AGM for Genesis Reciprocal Insurance Exchange. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, we will move on to the RM, RMA spring meetings uh, information as well. And this uh, came from our chief administrative officer. And also I had had a phone call from Sebastian um, from the Bazano detachment as, as well. So. Um, what are your wishes, Council? I didn't get any response when I mentioned uh, last week, I think it was, about the the Bizano request that they, or, or the information they had given us. And, you know, in the past, when we have been up at convention, usually the RMAs has has had the meetings coincide at the same time. And I haven't attended a, a meeting for a long time. Um, there were occasions where we went because we did have some reasons to attend, but in the past few years, certainly um, the only, only things we've had to say about our RCMP services are good things. And you know what? Having said that, perhaps it would be a, um, a, 
you know, sometimes it's good to, to give feedback about good things as well. And certainly a letter could do that as easily as a, as a meeting, taking time to meet. But the other thing I'm a little unsure of, and um, apparently uh, Bruce McDonald has, is no longer in charge in, in uh, Brooks. And so I guess we'll find out in, uh, whenever we have our next report because that invitation, Matt, came from someone different, correct? Yeah, from uh, Gord Yetman is uh, Bruce's replacement. He's called me a, a few times, seems like a nice enough guy. Sounds like they're looking for a property in the county and he's uh, he's at the helm now in the, in the city. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, Tracy. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think it would be. I don't necessarily think maybe we all maybe, but because he's new, it might not be a good thing. And it, it's always good just to get updates and stuff from the RCMP. So um, I don't know if it's not too much trouble if they're asking. I think that we should meet them. Um, it. Well, cer certainly we could meet with uh, Sergeant Yetman. Um, he would be attending our our uh, council meeting eventually, so like Bruce has been. So I think that that would be appropriate then. But um, what are other people's feelings? Hubie, you have your hand up. Uh, Sergeant Yetman was at communities meeting a couple weeks ago and he's originally from Tabor. Yes, I think we should meet him again. Yeah. Just a great gentleman. So you want to make a special time like you're saying that we want to make these appointments for April 28th or 29th to do this with the commanding officer or do we want just to speak to um, our local sergeant? I'm a little confused here. Wayne. We should just wait till uh, the RCMP come for their update for meeting them. And as far as uh, Alberta's commanding officer, we really have no issues to discuss with him, do we? Uh, to my way of thinking, uh, the RCMP is doing a pretty good job. They keep us well informed with Pisano and Brooks. Uh, I have no problem with just waiting till with the council meeting when they give us an update. Yeah, and as yeah, as I mentioned, I think it's always good to to let people know when you're happy as well as you're annoyed with service, and so. Um, I personally wouldn't mind spending the time to put together a letter to send to the commanding officer of K Division and CC it, CC it to Sergeant Yetman and to um, Corporal Sebastian in Brooks. And people need to, uh, these days in particular, I think there's lots of grumpiness in our world that it's nice to hear some good news as well so would you uh think that would be appropriate clarence definitely appropriate molly and, and maybe it, in the letter we could so mention that for them to give it some thought if coming to council meetings has value for them because if it doesn't have a lot of value for them, that's fine, but make sure that they understand that our meetings are open for them if they want to come. As in always or in their usual time sort in of? In their usual, usual yeah. fashion. That, yeah. Yes. I mean, we, we don't insist that they're there and if they do want to sit and listen, that's, that's a super. Yeah, and I, it's a quarterly report, I think, that they bring to us. And uh, I think it's very important that that continue because uh, it, over the years, it's 
help develop relationships and and the communication stays open get to know these people and it's it's really really important so um let's put that in make it formal could i have a motion that we uh send a letter to the commanding officer of k division expressing our um satisfaction with our local detachments work nobody wants to do that wayne has his hand up oh sorry wayne <laughs> wayne yeah i'll make that motion molly okay if, if you will write the letter because uh i'm sure not gonna <laughs> it will be handled <laughs> And you know what, I think at this, this is a bit of a pertinent time in the history of the RCMP within our communities as well. So um, all in favor of that motion. Opposed, the motion is carried. And so we will do that. And let's go back to our 11 o'clock delegation. Um, Jeff and Mark. For this, I believe. So, uh, well, welcome. I will. Uh, um, I'll just. Try, I'm going to turn off my. I'm going to turn off my mic, and maybe that will help uh, either Mark or Jeff to kick things off here, because I. Uh, they communicated with me and uh, wanted to have a visit, uh, or thank to thank Brian and to thank me for attending their open house on the virtual open house they held. And so uh, anyhow, I suggested that if they had further information they wanted or just to come to council. So here they are today. So welcome, Mark and Jeff. I, I, Mark, can you, is your audio working okay? Mark, is your audio working okay? Yeah, I'm having some problem I'm hearing, but I, I can hear now. So if you want me to. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Anyone who is just listening, please make sure your microphone is muted. I just I'll say thank you for inviting us here to uh, um, speak today. Um, we have a, a slideshow prepared that I think might be the easiest way to just kind of walk through, um, you know, what it is that we're here to talk about. It's about a solar farm that we're proposing, um, uh, and I think the slide um, deck is probably the best way to uh, just go through that, if that's possible, to put that up there. Is that is that uh, sorry uh, with this uh, technology? It's a little new for us. Um, so one of you are trying to share it. Oh. Okay, I think I've got it. Perfect. It, is that working? Yes. Okay, Mark. Sounds good. Do you want to put it full screen maybe? Or is that, is that good enough? Everyone can see? Doesn't matter. As, as long as everyone can see. Very nice. Okay. Andre, if you want to go into the first page. Okay, quick bit of background um, about SolarCraft. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, you know, we've been building large scale solar farms for about 10 years now. Um, around the time that um, there was a big um, subsidized solar build out happening in Ontario, um, you know, we started um, developing power plants 
um, not in Ontario, but um, around the Mojave Desert in California, even though we're a Canadian company, 100% Canadian owned. Um, we went there because that was the first place in North America where solar could compete um, without pricing subsidies against conventional generation. And that's been our business model and our only focus right from the very beginning. So we haven't participated in any place where we needed government subsidies um, to be able to make um, a solar farm work. Next slide, please. So um, many of you have probably heard about um, you know, what we're doing in Alberta. We call it Prairie Sunlight. Um, it's a portfolio um, of um, several solar farms. The reason that we uh, take this approach is that um, historically solar um, kind of earned a reputation as needing pricing subsidies. We see it in um, Germany's old subsidized solar build out from 20 years and 15 years ago and Ontario's build out. Um, one of the key problems that solar faced from these subsidized programs is that governments didn't want to spend a huge amount of money on these subsidies, but they wanted to show that they were doing good things and they knew that solar was, a, you know, a really a remarkable, um, you know, clean technology. And so they wanted to highlight solar farms being built, but they didn't want to spend a lot on those solar farms. So most of the time, solar farms were kept down to reasonably small size, five or 10 megawatts, so that the amount of subsidy required to buy that power, um, like in Ontario at 40, 50 cents per kilowatt hour, um, was, you know, was reasonable. Um, the problem, of course, was that um, whether it's um, a coal generator, a natural gas generator, or a solar generator, scale is absolutely critical in uh, how, um, you know, the levelized cost of the power plays out over the long term. So this was self-defeating, and it's one of the reasons why we never participated in that kind of stuff, because you need scale if you're gonna do things um, cost-effectively, and that's been our focus from the beginning. So our build-out in um, Alberta involved not just reasonably large size solar farms, which was important, but also to build them contiguously so that we could roll construction capability from one system right to the next, and we could lever some of the economies that you get from even larger power plants by building a chain, um, a portfolio of power plants. So here on the list, you can see our Prairie Sunlight 2 and 3 um, down around Vauxhall, um, our Vauxhall and Hull system. Um, they were the first two solar farms um, in Canada built without subsidies. Um, it is a wonderful thing that this, of course, not surprisingly happens in Alberta. The first time solar farms were built in, um, you know, in Canada without government subsidies, it happened in Alberta, and those are our projects. Um, I remember we, we, you know, were telling people um, five years ago, six years ago, when we started developing in Alberta, what we were going to do um, and how we were going to do it. And you know, you can see now we um, co constructed both of those solar farms um, using um, the you know, broad range of Alberta construction capability that was available to us. We didn't bring in outside contractors. Um, you know, the project lead, the project manager, she was from Sterling. So, you know, everything right on through was about not only, you know, hiring local and using local capability of which there's really an abundance in Alberta. You know, really, is there any place, um, you know, that you can imagine on earth where people are better at, you know, say driving steel into the ground, which is Kind of the, one of the cornerstones to how we build these solar farms with steel piles so you know we did exactly um, what we had projected that we would do um, and currently um, we have the next two solar farms um, our Rentham solar farm um, and our Stratmore solar farm um, that are currently under construction a um, little bit larger um, than the first two um, a slight distinction in that um, prairie sunlight two and three and Rentham um, are all with our uh, partner RWE Energy. Um, they're Germany's largest power company, 120 year old um, company. Our Stratmore Solar Farm um, and our Prairie Sunlight One Enchant Solar Farm, those have been announced um, by Capital Power, Alberta's largest um, generator, um, as they are the end owner and the financing partner um, for those systems. So, um, you know, we're, we're proud of the partners that we've brought to Alberta and in this case with Capital Power, 
Um, we're also proud to um, really partner with um, one of the stalwart um, Alberta names and Canadian names um, in uh, in energy. So, and this project here um, is again with RWE. So, on to the next slide, please. So, you know, how do we do it? Um, there's a lot of talk, um, especially from the history of solar in Ontario about, you know, will this increase power prices or will it increase the cost of my power? You know, the absolute reality is that one, Southern Alberta and over into Southwestern Saskatchewan, you can see on that little map on the, button, on the left side there, it holds Canada's highest solar resource. Um, you know, th there's an, a, a real abundance um, of sunlight um, in this region, and that's why it's the first place, you know, for us that this became viable. It was the first place in Canada where building solar farms competitively made sense. Um, next to it, you can see the graph that I'm sure you've seen. The price of solar modules around the time that we started back in 2009, um, the price of solar modules was cut in half um, after a long kind of slow decline in the cost of making silicon-based modules. Um, and that's kind of continued to creep down over the last four or five years. But really, a lot of the um, price savings or cost savings in deploying solar have been derived more from the economies of scale that are out there now. We have a much, much larger manufacturing capability globally um, for solar modules and some of the other balance of system components like inverters um, and even the tractor systems that we use. So that was the driver really for the last five years and continuing to bring the price um, of deploying um, large scale solar down even more. So that solar now in many parts of the planet, those that have a high solar resource like Southern Alberta, it's simply the most cost effective way to make electricity and it's more cost effective um, to build a solar farm, including the very substantial capex capital expenditures that you have to service them for the next 30 years um, to put all of that capital on the ground. It's still more cost effective on a levelized cost of power standpoint um, to do that than to continue to operate um, some of the old, old forms of generation, specifically coal and even natural gas. So it's really the most competitive form of generation. And when there are um, you know, procurements for power like in India and some other places that are completely agnostic about the technology Solar tends to run the table in those jurisdictions because the price is so competitive now. On the far right, um, the last graph is also important. I touched on that earlier. You can see how economies of scale on a system basis are absolutely crucial as well too. We can, we can put solar modules um, you know, on the roofs of houses. We can even put them on cars if we want to. We can do all kinds of fun things with them, but it doesn't mean that that's gonna result in a competitive priced electricity coming from there. So there are lots of niche applications where you can use it, especially if you're off grid in remote locations. But for us, the focus has always been squarely on how do we get the price of electricity as low as we can, and that invariably involves scale. And you can see the little graph there. If you build small, especially say under, like we were talking about under boutique um, procurement um, programs, if you build small boutique solar farms, you're gonna pay through your teeth for the power and that's not good for anyone. People want electricity to make things go, to make you know, their, their um, household appliances, their industries, the irrigation, um, everything you know, requires um, uh, electricity. And at the end of the day, people just want it as cost effectively as possible. They don't, they don't want boutique electricity. Uh, next slide, please. The community benefits, I mean, we could go on at um, some length. Um, this solar farm, um, is on land that we're leasing from the Eastern Irrigation District. Um, the picture in the middle there is our Vauxhall um, Perry Sunlight um, uh, 3 solar farm. That was you know, really technically Canada's very first solar farm that we built. That was built on Bow River Irrigation District land. Whenever possible, we like to partner um, with a landowner um, that is intertwined in the community because the benefits derived from the lease revenue on top of the property taxes that the county benefits from and thereby really everybody in the county benefits from. But when you have the added layer of very substantial lease revenue flowing directly into a community-based organization like an, um, like an irrigation district, um, it affords um, financial flexibility um, that has a broader impact on the community. And in the case of the Bow River Irrigation District where um, you know, we've been leasing um, their land for the solar farm that you see there, 
um, you know, you can see they're undergoing some irrigable acre expansions um, because they have a little bit more flexibility than they did before financially. Um, when it comes to the labor involved in building solar farms, um, there is a lot of labor um, for the solar farms that we built, as we said we would do. Um, we hired um, all Alberta construction contractors, I think 75 or 80 percent, um, you know, were um, originally trained in, in the oil fields or working in oil and gas. Um, because again, the overlapping capability of what we need for construction, um, you know, aligns really well with the capability that Alberta already has, um, you know, available. So um, the benefits um, are um, substantial. Next slide, please. Um, this is just, just a depiction of where the project is. Um, and again, when we see on the right side, the economic um, benefits and the permanency, um, a solar farm like this, um, when we manage to put, um, for this solar farm in particular, approximately um, half a billion dollars of capital on the ground, um, we, we're not tied to commodity inputs in order to make electricity going forward. So that really de-risks a generator. We, we don't have to worry about if natural prices, sorry, natural gas prices um, are going to go up because of additional pipeline capacity um, to the coast or anywhere else. Um, increasing the cost of our of our uh, resource that we need to make electricity. We just need sunshine, um, and most importantly, we need to put a lot of capital, um, expensive capital equipment on the ground in order to capture that sunshine and make it into electricity. So that model is a very, very long-term model. And just like when you, um, say, buy a home and you have a very substantial mortgage that you have to service, you have to make ends meet on the front end. That's the most difficult time. You have to be able to overcome um, the front end hurdle to be able to service that. After that, things only get better as you pay off your mortgage. And once the mortgage is paid off, in this case, a 30 year initial financial cycle, the solar farm at that point, of course, continues uh, to produce electricity. And without the capital um, expenditures to worry about, um, it becomes even more competitive. It goes from being on the front end, the most competitive form of generation to really becoming um, um, an action, a legacy in, in, you know, for the long term um, you know, for Alberta and any jurisdiction that it's deployed in because the modules have a 25 year um, warranty attached to them. Um, but we know because this technology has been around for much, much longer than that, that these modules continue to operate well beyond that. Um, realistically, after the 25 year initial um, uh, warranty would come up on the modules, we would do what's called repowering. We would take all the modules off the system, recycle them, put new modules on, and um, if the historical norm of slow, um, steady increases in module efficiency continue, we would probably uh, be able to generate about 20 to 30 percent more power from the exact same solar farm 25 years from now by putting those modules on. And with solar modules being about 30 percent of our total system cost, um, you can see that it, it really basically pays for itself down the road to do that and to start another 25-year, um, you know, cycle of production. The long and short of it is that, you know, once um, a solar farm like this overcomes that initial financing hurdle, as we've done without subsidies now, you know, with the four projects that we've either built or are currently constructing, um, they really, we can't see any technology that would bump um, a fully amortized solar farm um, off the grid, um, it would take something like cold fusion or, or even really something magical because the power price, then you're looking at a penny or, or two per kilowatt hour, um, you know, um, for the operating costs. Uh, next slide, please. So this um, solar farm is expansive. Um, and you can see uh, these are actual pictures on the left and the right in the center. The center is our hull um, solar farm. That's what they look like up close. Um, you can see the six foot um, chain link fence um, that goes around it. Um, those panels there are flat currently, which happens um, you know, around noon in the middle of the day as they track the sun from 45 degree tilt to the east in the morning to 45 degree tilt to the west at night. So when they're flat, they're about five, six feet, five, six feet off the ground. The pictures on the left and the right are further back. Um, the setbacks that we have right now in place for the solar farm, um, where you get 100, 200 meters away, this is, these are actual pictures of what it looks like at that kind of a distance. Um, and those pictures on the left and the right are both of the Vauxhall solar farm um, early in the morning when they're tracked to their maximum height. So, you know, unlike, um, you know, wind 
um, turbines, which are very, very high, you know, this kind of, this blends into the viewscape and invariably you can see um, trees and buildings and so on behind the solar farm because they do stay low enough that the visual, visual impact um, is already very moderate. And then if we take additional measures, um, we can really have a pronounced um, impact on, the, on the, uh, um, the visual quality that's retained. On to the next slide, please. Jeff and Mark. So I this is the site what? itself. Um, we're actually very um, excited about this solar farm because more than anything that we've seen in Alberta, it integrates um, existing energy use with new renewable energy use. Um, the land um, is sandwiched between two of southern Alberta's largest substations. Um, and then a little bit to the south there, you can see that, that large um, oil and gas battery. And you can see the pipelines, um, many, many wells um, of every um, age class um, that we work around. And we're okay with that. Um, this presents an engineering hurdle for us, um, but we're comfortable with that. We're well equipped to do that with a partner, RWE which again, um, they're one of the biggest um, you know, owners of renewables um, on the planet. And the experience that the combined experience we have affords us um, cost effectively, the ability to engineer around this kind of infrastructure to work with all the stakeholders um, to make sure that we produce an end result that really is the gold standard for how renewable energy can be deployed in and amongst existing um, energy infrastructure. So it's really um, an opportunity to extend the, the useful commercial life, um, in this case here, of formerly oil and gas facilities that continue to operate um, with uh, us using the surface. Um, and it, it goes from having an, a, a definite um, end life um, to the resource that's under the ground to an indefinite um, serviceable life to the facility um, because the resource and the only resource that we fundamentally rely on is the sunshine. Next slide, please. Can you guys hear me? Hello, Jeff and Mark. I just wanted to let you know that you only have about uh, uh, less than 10 minutes left in case there's questions. Uh -oh. Okay, for, for the benefit of Mark, um, if, if there's questions, um, we have less than 10 minutes left. Questions then, does that make sense? Sorry, Mark and Jeff, uh, just the, I keep having to mute and unmute you guys. It seems to be something on Mark's and it just creates a little bit of feedback. Um, so maybe as we're going through, if if you are answering a question, as soon as you're done, uh, maybe just mute yourself again and then that'll uh, alleviate some of that background uh, feedback. Sorry about that. And I just, it's Molly, I just wanted to say that we have another delegation. I was giving you guys till about 11.35 because we started later. But just so you know, your time is uh, passing. <laughs> okay, then we'll jump, how about we jump right into questions? I could hear, I could hear the moderator speaking perfectly. So if there's any problem hearing questions, then we can relay. But I can hear you fine now. So please, let's, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to jump right into those. Questions from Council? Kelly? Lionel? And Todd? In case you have any? I'll start it off with my usual question and Council, um, my apologies, you hear it every time. Um, I'm always interested in how you name these farms. Um, I, I just Googled Brooks Solar and um, I can see this project being easily confused with uh, Brooks One Solar Power Plant. So can you, can you explain to me how you come up with names when, when in fact you're not in Brooks? 
Um, generally speaking, we name it um, about some geographical feature. Often the substation drives um, the naming of the solar farm. Um, that's why the Renton solar farm originally and internally we call it the Conrad solar farm because it ties into the Conrad substation. Here, the West Brook substation, we surround it with this project, but we also um, you know, surround um, an, an, another substation. So um, the name is not final. And if there is a community uh, um, uh, in, you know, directive to name it something different, we're, we're entirely amenable to that. Can I go on record as saying yes? <laughs> um, I, just, I just really think that, um, uh, so as not to confuse with a farm that's already operating or a, a plant that is already operating, um, try and go a little bit different and recognize where you are located. Thank you. All Understood. Right. And, and, uh, we'll, we'll do that. Lionel has a um, Just a question about subsidies. You you stated you're, you're not sub you know, the power price is not subsidized. But is any of the capital for for building the project subsidized? I'm not like I'm very much in favor of this project. I think we have a huge amount of energy that we lose every day because the sun sun does provide a huge amount of energy. So I'm very much in favor of this project. But I have been asked by different people about the costs uh, of government monies going into these projects. Yeah, I can, I'll state clearly again, um, no, none of the capital was subsidized. Um, the solar farms that we built um, were balance sheet financed by RWE, um, as are, is, are the two solar farms that are currently being built, one by RWE, again, financed entirely the way that you finance a business. You make sure that you can make ends meet. Um, and in this case, a very heavy, heavy capital expenditure is the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome. Um, and, uh, you know, no, um, we don't take money from the government. The Little Brooks solar farm that you're talking about, that 15 megawatt one that was built, that one I think was half subsidized by the, um, uh, the original, the older, um, the former um, Alberta government, but that's not our solar farm. Um, we get, again, we haven't built um, subsidized solar farms like that. So, um, and then with Capital Power, I mean, I think you can go to their public filings. They announced, you know, our Enchant solar farm um, on their investors day um, and they announced um, the uh, our Stratmore solar farm, where we had you know 1,600 neighbors within the two-kilometer radius, um, you know and several hundred within the 800-kilometer radius, and you know one opponent and everybody else um, you know supported that project there because in Alberta, like you say, um, the reality that we found is that the vast majority of people are squarely behind a new technology like this that lowers the price of electricity when it can be. A, um, deployed without subsidies. And that's the message we've heard over and over again. Albertans, they get it. They get it really better than um, our experience from even people in California. Um, you know, Albertans get it. They just don't want to be involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a port project like happened in Ontario where, um, you know, you can, you can, you know, see how, what the power prices are and, um, you know, what we compete going forward. Um, you know, no, no subsidies, not on pricing and not on the, uh, the, the capital that comes into these. Thank you, that's exactly the answer I was waiting for. I have time for two more questions. Uh, our moderator has a question from an online participant, and then Brian. Thanks, Molly. Uh, this question comes from Pete Anderson, and he's, he typed in there, are these solar farms not taking up space on productive land that in one way or another grows food? I mean, that's always um, something that we look squarely at in siting our solar farms. The most important driver, of course, is the transmission system. You can't build a solar farm where you don't need electricity. So by building it in and amongst here, like literally at an open bay um, to one of Southern Alberta's biggest substations, we don't have to run transmission lines to our, so to our solar farm. So that's cornerstone. That's crucial um, because nobody likes to see tall transmission towers running around. Um, but as far as land use goes, you're absolutely right. Solar farms take up a substantial amount of land. 
So that's why we, whenever possible, um, look for land like here, where it's some of the most heavily impacted land by existing oil and gas infrastructure. If you go to the just the orphan well registry alone, um, it completely covered the screen um, just under that category alone, never mind the substantial operating um, assets, oil and gas assets that are still there. We're entirely comfortable working with energy. We're an energy business at the end of the day. Um, so we understand energy and we can work very well, again, with some additional engineering hurdles, but not significant additional cost hurdles if it's done properly. So here, this land has been very, very heavily impacted. It's kind of the real central energy hub for not only oil and gas, but um, you know the transmission system as well. So that's one way that we really minimize the impact. And we also try to avoid especially irrigated farmland um, whenever possible, because farming is obviously cornerstone to Alberta's economy and culture as well too. So we totally get that. And you know this land here is actually very, very well suited, singularly so, in integrating the multiple uses and continuing to operate the oil and gas infrastructure there, allow for the future decommissioning of that oil and gas infrastructure, working in concert with how we build the system, and yet still allowing grazing in any areas that we don't use, um, because the solar farm isn't going to occupy that entire footprint at all. It'll be less than half of that, because we have to work around and we don't encroach on any of the existing oil and gas pipelines, easements, and a bunch of other values that are there as well. So that the actual footprint will be um, a, a look like a series of smaller solar farms in that project area. So it, uh, and that's so yes, we focus very, we care a lot about making sure that the land that we use is, is well suited for the solar farm. Thank you. And Brian, final question. Minor, minor, very quick questions. I have two. One is it in, is this land located entirely on the Eastern Irrigation District property? And the second question is uh, based on your numbers and the employment figures uh, invested in the capital costs. Um, I, I, I led to believe that it'll be about $250 million if you think half of the cost of the capital cost, which you said is a half a billion is going to be invested into uh, into the Alberta economy. So um, curious about the percentage of that that you estimate will be directly invested in the county of Newland and, and the area around Brooks that and businesses and um, and the EID uh, component of both the land. Um, the project is uh, situated almost exclusively on EID land. Um, there are a couple of parcels are on the outside, um, you know, that uh, may or may not be occupied in the final design, depending how things shape up. But, um, you know, the, 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 the needs of the project come first um, when it comes to, uh, you know, what we use and, and what kind of land we use. So we, the, the vast majority in any case is on EID land. Um, and uh, when it comes to the overall split of how the capital is allocated, the single biggest um, element to building one of these solar farms nowadays is, is labor. Um, I mentioned the modules are the next biggest at about 30% or just below 30% of the total system cost. Um, so that, um, you know, the steel we usually source locally, um, we got that from Edmonton. I don't know where that supplier got it from, but I believe it was all Canadian steel that for the solar farms that we've built. So we try to source everything as, as, as locally as possible. And definitely the labor, we don't um, have a work, we build work camps. So we do have um, the labor, um, you know, from as close to the solar farm as possible. Um, and in this case, you know, we're, we're looking at um, probably uh, around a thousand people that will be working on the solar farm at the height of construction. And then through the operation and management of the system, you know, indefinitely going forward, there will still be, a, um, for a project this size, probably a couple of dozen anyways, um, jobs that will be uh, um, focused on, the, on all of the tasks required to keep it operating um, indefinitely. Okay. Thank you, Mark and Jeff. And I know uh, you're available if uh, councillors have other questions or public have other questions as well going forward. So, um, your contact information is available. Thank you for being here today. And we will move on to our next delegation.
for, uh, excuse me, Molly, if I could just interject quickly, uh, for Todd Beasley and Jeff Allison, I've got you guys unmuted. And just in case we experience some feedback, again, if you're not talking, maybe just mute your mic and then you have full control for, uh, for that after the fact. Thank you, uh, Todd. Our moderator is Todd Green, not to be confused with Todd Beasley. And welcome, Jeff and Todd, and we'll just let you take it away. Thanks, Molly, and uh, thank you, uh, Jeff and Todd. So, uh, folks, can you see my presentation on the screen right now? Not yet. Okay. We have it in front of us, if that's any kind of a help in, in the package. Well, it's a little different here. Um, let me just... We'll let you work see. on it. <laughs> okay. This technology never works quite as quickly or as well. During the last presentation, all of a sudden, all the little squares of the people came up on my screen and you were all vibrating and jiggling and I went, whoa, what does this mean? I was very relieved when it all went back to normal. I have no idea why this won't share. Okay, is that working now, folks? Yes, it is. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my honor to have the opportunity to present uh, the project that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is an opportunity for a, a, a new industrial park for the, the city of Brooks and for the county of Newell. And ultimately, what we believe we can do is provide uh, dispatchable electricity for the grid and for one of our largest industries uh, in our, our community, which is JBS. Now our corporation, Delta Corp or Delta Clean Tech, we are working with the Alberta government at the Alberta Carbon Capture Technology Center of Excellence at the Shepherd Power plant just outside of Calgary. Uh, we are providing the carbon capture technology for the Carbon Capture Technology Center of Excellence. Now this particular project is vying for uh, the Environmental X Prize. It's extremely high profile. Uh, oh, can everybody hear me okay? I'm in the picture, not you. Okay, so, so there's, an there's an opportunity for uh, what we're doing at Shepherd uh, to be brought to Brooks. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna describe the, the opportunity. I'm gonna describe the current state of some of our conversations that we've had and give you an explanation of, of uh, what the, the potential is for our community. So just starting off with Delta, uh, our corporation, uh, Jeff Allison, who's online, he's our president, and I'm the vice president of the company. Uh, we have a number of, of divisions within this group. We have carbon capture and solvent management. We have carbon trading. Uh, we were one of the largest carbon traders on the, the Chicago Stock Exchange for agricultural carbon credits here a few years ago. Uh, we have hydrogen production, uh, which is of course very, very topical in the news lately. And, and uh, all of this is very synergistic in terms of, of uh, the technologies that we bring to bear. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't pick up a newspaper these days without talking about uh, or reading stories about uh, environmental social governance. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, either a corporation, a municipality, and if you have to uh, ultimately uh, answer to shareholders or stakeholders, many of them have obligations or expectations that you have a commitment to environmental social governance. The carbon tax, it's not going anywhere. We probably all saw earlier this morning, the Supreme Court has announced that uh, they do believe that it is in fact uh, in good standing. Uh, the Liberals, if uh, you believe Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, uh, the carbon tax will increase uh, until such point as we have met our Paris obligations. And when it comes down to it, that has significant implications for business and for businesses' profitability and sustainability. 
So just backing up a little bit, um, outside of Calgary is the Shepherd Power Plant, and the Shepherd Power Plant is taking natural gas off the grid. Uh, they're putting it into jet turbines, and they're producing somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of Calgary's base load. Alberta Innovates, the Alberta Research Council, through the Canadian Oil Sands Investment Arm, uh, had gone ahead and, and established the center of excellence at this location to be able to showcase technologies that use carbon dioxide uh, in a manner that doesn't require taxation to go forward. You know, as, as we're wont to say, the easiest way to help industry adopt new processes, new procedures, is to make it economically advantageous to do so. And that's exactly what's happening at Shepherd. So industry, in order to foster this development, together with the Alberta government, uh, they've invested millions of dollars and they've actually put up a substantial cash prize for corporations that are coming in and vying for the title of literally the world's best. Uh, th this is, uh, it's germane to what we're doing, but really what this comes down to is the participants that are involved at Shepherd. So if you look in the middle of, of this slide, you can see our corporation's technology. We're intersecting emissions from the plant's main uh, smokestack. We're taking it into our carbon capture unit uh, it's it's being combusted and it's about a four to six percent co2 concentration leaving the stack but what our technology does is it upgrades it and it concentrates it and purifies it so that we're in excess of 95 percent co2 that is now available via pipeline for these individual project participants now what's really quite exciting about this is these five corporations were shortlisted from over a hundred companies that applied to be part of that. So what you're looking at in Calgary, Alberta, is you're looking at the state of the art, worldwide, world's best, uh, that, are, that were selected and are now taking CO2 and, and turning it into value. Just on the back side here, you can see the cut group. Uh, they're taking CO2 and turning it into graphene. Uh, CERT is producing advanced bioplastics using CO2 as a foundation. So uh, polyhydroxybutyrate, biodegradable plastics, and you know we know the implications for mankind with that type of an approach. C2N2, they're taking carbon dioxide and they're turning it into carbon nanotubes. Uh, I believe that our children and grandchildren are going to be using carbon fiber and it will be the material construction of, of choice for uh, our society going forward and these technologies are being demonstrated, as I say, at this location. Airco, which is a fun one, they're taking carbon dioxide off of our skid and they're turning it into alcohols. If you can imagine, they're actually taking CO2 and they're making uh, vodkas uh, out of it and, and alcohols. So it has very uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, uses in terms of value added. Carbon Cure over on the right side, what they're doing is they're taking carbon dioxide and they are infusing it into carbon or into concrete to make concrete lighter with a higher MPA rating. Now the point of all of these corporations and the implications for Brooks is this, is these are corporations that are commercial and ready to go and they were selected out of 100 and this represents what I said earlier, the state of the art in terms of, of carbon capture and carbon usage uh, technologies that are now available. Here on this slide is what we're here to talk to you about today and to ask for you uh, to consider supporting this project. What we have is we have an opportunity to take what's happening at Shepherd and quite literally bring it to Brooks. What our proposal is, is, is we will take natural gas directly from Torxon and no Torxon will supply us that natural gas upstream of the transportation infrastructure. So what that allows us to do is to have a significant economic benefit in terms of energy into electricity generation. The second thing is, is we would supply that electricity directly to the JBS facility uh, outside of the transportation grid. So we don't have the distribution fees associated with uh, producing power, putting it into a grid, and then ultimately having it consumed. You know, we can all look at our monthly power bills and we can see that the cost of an electron, the cost of a kilowatt, 
uh, is generally relatively small on our monthly power bill, uh, but it is uh, significantly increased when we add the distribution infrastructure associated with it. So these two uh, benefits represent a significant reduction in terms of the cost of uh, kilowatts being available for JBS. What the third advantage that we would bring to the table is we would uh, put our carbon capture technologies on the emissions of these engines. That carbon, that CO2 would be upgraded, exactly what we're doing at Shepherd, and we would make it available via pipeline for industries that we will invite to set up in the Brooks area. And we've had conversations with the, the uh, COSIA XPRIZE uh, participants, and many of them are very interested in coming to our community because we've got advantages in electricity, we've got advantages in carbon dioxide being available, which they can then turn into value added. And when we look at some of the larger extensions of that, uh, we can actually take our CO2 and it can go to Methanex down in Medicine Hat as a building block for methanol production. And ultimately, we're also able to add that uh, into enhanced oil recovery, uh, like what the Saskatchewan government is doing uh, next door, at, uh, just outside of Estevan. Now, we have uh, significant applications in place through Emissions Reductions Alberta, and I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. But the bottom line is, is we believe that we can bring a new industrial park to the community, which is ethical, which is a, a world-class showcase, and it's based on what we're doing uh, at the Shepherd facility. Now, we have had a number of conversations with all of the participants, and I'm going to describe this a little further in the minute, but what we're able to do is we're able to generate the most valuable electricity in our grid, which is prime power, but it's also dispatchable power. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to quite frankly provide stability to the grid that's being taken away from some of the additions of renewables uh, into the grid. Now I'm gonna give you a quick uh, status update in terms of where we're at on this project. So Torxon is, is uh, of course they acquired many of the Incana Sonovas assets from the Saskatchewan border up to Strathmore. Uh, John Brennan, who's the president, uh, we've had a number of conversations with them and I'm very pleased to report that they will support this project. They will provide electricity from the 13 to 24 location, which is just on the number one highway at the number one highway in the 36, uh, the 36 highway going north and south. Uh, they, would per, they would present the gas, not electricity. S sorry, they're, they're gonna give us the gas in a manner uh, that is not uh, attracting the Trans-Canada pipeline distribution fees. It would su be supplied directly from our, their location, directly to our engines. And again, that's a pretty significant economic benefit. Now, David Colwell, who is the president of JBS, I've had the opportunity to visit with him on a number of occasions. And we talked about the potential of this project. And, and here's what was said to me previously. If electricity doubles, the JBS plant is in jeopardy. If it triples, that plant will not be here. When it comes down to it, uh, David put us in direct contact with Jim Mullins, who is JBS's engineering manager. He's based out of uh, Greeley, uh, Colorado. And we have weekly conversations with them. We actually have one scheduled this afternoon and we're advancing towards a memorandum of understanding in terms of what the contractual uh, issues are going to look like. But, but what Jim said to us a couple of weeks back is this, and this is very important, I think, for the, for the board of directors of the County of Newell. The recent experiences in Texas has told us that the grid is not as stable as we would like it to be from either an electricity reliability perspective or from a cost perspective. As a result of what happened in, in Texas, uh, you can see in the news the requirement for dispatchable micro power projects is increasing at an exponential rate. As wind and solar, non-dispatchable uh, power is added to the grid when it exceeds 10%, it provides and has the potential of an intrinsic instability of the grid 
And that's exactly what happened in, in Texas. So at the end of the day, for us to be able to produce electricity, we can stabilize JBS, uh, both in terms of electricity supply and cost of that electricity over time. But we can then use the emissions to attract new industry into our community. So we have sent applications for partial funding on this project to ERA Alberta, and they are prepared to treat this application as, as a singular entity uh, because we believe that we could be a shovel ready with political support and with regulatory support as early as this summer, uh, mid to, to end of season. I've had the opportunity to bring Barry and, and Martin uh, over to the Shepherd facility and we'll extend the same invitation to anybody on the board that may be interested in coming to Shepherd. Uh, but Barry has provided uh, a significant level of support uh, in both letter support and in uh, quiet discussions with the Alberta government to, su to support this project. Uh, Martin is, is uh, you know, also uh, feels very, very strongly ab about this potential. And we had Greg McLean, who's the shadow energy minister uh, for the Conservative Party of Canada. He and his team came over and it was a fun comment that he had after we described what we're attempting to do in Brooks. He said, how, how can we get some of that? Because uh, that, quite frankly, is an extremely exciting potential of being able to provide stability for our major industry. And at the end of the day, to be able to have additional dispatchable power that can help stabilize our grid. And at the end of the day, to be able to use those emissions in a highly ethical manner that we believe can go ahead and, and uh, add a significant new job potential and investment to potential for our community. So what are we asking you to do? Uh, quite frankly, folks, we're, we're asking for your consider on consideration on a chunk of land. And I'll, I'll bring up a PDF that uh, Jeff Tiffin was uh, very gracious in, in helping us put together uh, for an 8.85 acre site uh, at the 13 and 24 location. We're going to ask for your support for a letter of support for funding request. And we're going to ask for your consideration to perhaps provide uh, help with both the civil and logistical considerations for the project. Now, um, what it comes, to, let me see here. So when we look at the implications of this location and what it means for ethical power, uh, this is truly a, a showcase project right on the number one highway, right at the confluence of the 36 highway. And, and quite frankly, uh, this could be but, the first- but we're, not, we're not seeing the, uh, the, the we're still seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, let me just see if I can get the uh, the land up here, Jeff. And uh, okay, is, is that up now? No, nope, still seeing the PowerPoint. Still seeing the PowerPoint. How's that one now? Okay, bear with me here, Jeff. Okay. Okay, so I think you can you you can see this now. Yeah. So here, here's the JBS location, ladies and gentlemen. This is the new tailings ponds that they are going to be covering up, and I'll talk about that significance in just a second. This is the uh, Volker Steven uh, transportation uh, sheds on the highway. Uh, I think all of the, the highway uh, maintenance equipment is there together with sand and salt. And then the Torxon location is right here. And there's about a half a dozen engines that are in there that are uh, taking shallow gas, compressing it and putting it into the grid. What we're asking for your consideration on is this chunk of land right here. Now, what we're, we're fortunate is, is that there isn't any meaningful surrounding landowners and occupants uh, around the area. So we would not expect any opposition to the project because I'm assuming this is already zoned industrial. Uh, we would take gas from Torxon, generate electricity. The power lines would come directly to JBS into their substation at this location. 
and we were, uh, intend to approach the EID uh, for consideration on this land for the new industrial park where these new uh, uh, industries we believe we can attract to, to Brooks and area. So uh, there's already gas lines going through here. So we're able to take the emissions off of these ponds and actually put those back into the engines. So maybe some of the odor that might come out of this, some of the methane and energy potential would be captured to produce electricity out of it. Uh, Torxon is prepared to supply us gas under long-term contract. So what that means is, is the stability over time of the kilowatts that we will produce will ultimately provide the stability for one of JBS's largest utilities. They are also interested in the carbon dioxide. So I wasn't aware of this, but when they actually process uh, meat into hamburger, they actually infuse it with carbon dioxide is, is a, a method for a sterilant, and it actually helps change the consistencies to what we see on, on, the, uh, on, on our grocery uh, shelves. They also are significant users of carbon dioxide in the form of dry ice, and we can produce that at this location as well. And the immediate industry that we will attract to the area is data mining, is, is data acquisition, and uh, we believe that we can do that all at this, uh, at this uh, 13 to 24 location. Folks, I hope I've described this project. Jeff, is there anything that I, I uh, uh, should have touched on that I didn't that you might want to bring up? No, thanks, Todd. I, I think you, you covered it pretty much, and I think we've used up our allocation of time, so maybe we could go straight to questions. We'd be delighted to, to answer any questions that you folks might have. And uh, what it comes down to is, is uh, we're quite excited about this. Uh, we're, we're quite far along. Uh, JBS is very interested in this. Uh, what we need to do in order to get a contract finished, and, and uh, the, the engineering team down south uh, knew, knew that we were meeting today, and what they, they're asking for your help on is to help us finalize these remaining costs. Land infrastructure is a significant component to this. So what we need to ultimately do is to come back with a cost per kilowatt produced, which is would be considered a totally installed number. And when we spoke with Jeff and and uh, had previous visits with Molly, we you know we we went ahead and and said uh, it's going to come to the time when we're going to need your support, and that's why we're here today. So I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. So um, this is Molly. Jeff, uh, could you perhaps introduce yourself? I neglected to have you do that to begin. Yes, thank you very much, Molly. Uh, my name is Jeff Allison. And I'm, I'm the president of Delta, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, uh, you know, we've. Uh, it seems that all of the components that we need for, for these projects seem to all come together in your community. The supply of stranded gas, the uh, the majority user of the power which provides us the cash flow we need we need for to make this economic uh, we have the the capital available uh, between ourselves and our partners uh, to uh, to build the project um, we're planning on on building the uh, the capture unit uh, in in the Brooks area with some of your fabricators and uh, some of your uh, you know your uh, your oil field people that provide all of the electrical connections, et cetera, and engineering and labor. So, uh, and, and Todd's from your community, as you, as you know, and uh, he's very excited to, to bring uh, this project to your area and, and thinks it will be a, really a, a good uh, boost, not only economic boost, but also a, a, a boost from a, a, a publicity point of view, because having a carbon-free uh, industrial park Will probably be the the subject of uh, of many documentaries uh, of things like Nova and uh, and other things that like to sort of feature new ways in which you can do business uh, in in an environmentally friendly manner. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope you look favorably to this uh, to this project. Thanks, Jeff. Questions, um, Ellen, Wayne. 
gentlemen for presentation. How exciting. It sounds wonderful. Now, the one that you have in Shepherd, um, how, you may have touched on this. Sometimes the, the sound was not that clear. Um, is, has that been in production for quite a while? And it's, yeah, that's basically my question. And, and how, if it was okay there. Let, let, let me answer that. Yeah, go answer ahead, that. Jeff. Thanks, Ellen, for your question. Um, the one at Shepherd really is just a demonstration plant. It's actually a, a very small plant. It's only about six tons a day of CO2. And it really was designed just more or less to allow, provide enough CO2 to these demonstration plants that Todd was talking about uh, to allow the X Prize Committee to evaluate them from who's going to win the $10 million prize. Uh, our company, however, has been involved in many, many larger projects all over the world for capturing of CO2. Um, some of the local ones we're working on, and Todd kind of mentioned it a little bit, was that the, the carbon nanotubes group out of uh, Shepherd uh, has, been, um, has been commercialized by uh, Capital Power and they're looking at setting up a, a very large commercial scale unit up in the, at their Genesee plant. But like I said, we've, we've been working in the UK, in Australia, in Korea, in China. So there's many large, large CO2 capture plants, but there's never been a, 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 a carbon free industrial park. And, uh, and, uh, and so this will be a, a something new really for your area. In, in something unique, but it's technology that's well known. It's like like Todd was mentioning. It's 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 gas engines that that are that have been used in the oil patch for many years. Uh, it's uh, it's um, our carbon capture technology that's commercial, ready to go. It's not in any kind of science experiment here we're worth talking about, and it's it's uh, something that can be immediately uh, revenue generating because. JBS is excited to have take themselves off the grid, and uh, and and take get some dedicated power, uh, with some potential backup power by remaining, being connected to the grid as well, but they only use it in cases of the fact that if for any reason, uh, you know we can't supply. Thank you, Corey. And, uh, information. Thank you so much, okay. Councillor Hammergen, Wayne. I got two questions actually. Uh, it someplace I couldn't find it exactly, but you you said that you wanted the county to help you act with the land. Uh, do we own that little piece of land that you want to set your plant up on? That right Go next ahead. to. And also the other one is: Are you subject to this carbon tax that the federal government is implementing? Uh, well, I'll answer it again. I, I, from what we understand is that, that off of that map is the county does own that land. And uh, the second, your second question is, our company um, does benefit directly from, from this carbon tax in the fact that any large emitter in Alberta right now, uh, if, they, if they generate, say, a million tons a year of CO2, uh, then, then you'd multiply how many tons you generate times the fifty dollars a ton, going up to one hundred and seventy dollars a ton over over a period of time, and you can see that that's a significant cost to them. So if they can now capture that CO two, and they can actually sell it, there's the potential. Not will it, it won't cost them money. It'll actually save them money or potentially make them money. So there's some real benefit to them uh, because of carbon taxes to, to be part of this project. So in other um, words, you only tax on the carbon you emit. You're not, anything you capture is not, uh, not taxed? That's correct. That would be the third uh, intrinsic benefit of, of what we're proposing because ultimately the electricity that would go to JBS would not attract the carbon tax number one. And secondly, the emissions that are projected to come out of those tailings ponds that they've got, we can actually eliminate that because we can use that methane source as energy in our drivers. And we capture the CO2 out of the exhaust stacks 
and we ultimately turn it into value of these other industries uh, that that we will attract to the area. Uh, we've got an immediate uh, opportunity uh, for putting it into uh, EOR, and we've got an immediate opportunity of putting it into uh, down in Medicine Hat uh, into methanol production. And the, and the third benefit really is is, and I think anybody that's driven by Brooks in the summer could certainly appreciate all of those uh, all of that smell being eliminated going forward and, and having those methane being used for more productive. Thank you. Other questions? Hubie, Anne-Marie, and Brian. Thanks, Molly. Uh, this is for Todd Beasley. So Todd, a few years back, you made a presentation to Parliament, to the federal government, and I'm wondering how receptive they were to this. Hubie, I really appreciate that question. You know what it came down to is, is the Conservatives were extremely positive. Um, the block was just the block. I mean, it was it was disappointing, quite frankly. And what I can say is is that the we we had a half a dozen conservative MPs that that came to Shepherd uh, over the last while, and they were just over the moon in terms of the potential. They they the quote was, "This is this is a project that Parliament needs to hear." When I was in. Parliament, I testified to the uh, International Free Trade Committee about this time last year. So that was the second time I was honored to, uh, to come to Parliament. Uh, the national news editor of, of the Globe and Mail, we had an opportunity, Martin introduced me to him, and we had an opportunity to sit down afterwards. And he said, this is a story that Canada needs to hear. I mean, we, we Alberta in particular, we lead the world in development of environmental technologies. And that is exactly what we're talking about bringing to Brooks, is that showcase potential. And, you know, as Jeff said earlier, this project's going to attract a lot of attention. Uh, I was disappointed in some of the parliamentarians, but, you know, the, the people that mattered, that cared, I mean, you could just tell they were fully engaged in the conversation. Yeah. That, thank you, Hubie. Uh, Marie? For your presentation, Todd and Jeff. My question is back to your ask for the county. So the 8.8 .8 acres that we own, um, are you looking at buying that? Are you looking at leasing that for us? And the second part of the question is, in your presentation, you talk about civil work. So that would be water and sewer. And so again, is that an ask for the county to supply that to you? Yes, we'd, we'd, we'd like you to consider this, folks. You know, we believe the implications for long term is significant and we'd like you to, to respond to us what would you like to see if a commercial relationship around that land uh, I, I wouldn't have any problem asking you to consider uh, giving it to us in very favorable terms because of what we hope to do in the community but we're also going to need civil development if you look at that location and you look at the roads access to the number one highway that needs to be considered and the third thing is, is any uh, permit requirements that would need to be approved by the county for you to consider um, favorable status. The ERA funding, uh, it, it's a significant potential for the project. We've asked for $9 million and, and they appear to be very engaged in the conversation. But what they're looking for is they're looking for quote unquote, shovel ready projects. So when we were able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and we explained the status of our conversation with JBS and Torxon, we fully had their attention. But of course, regulatory, uh, those things can take time. Uh, access to the land, being able to go ahead and put all of that infrastructure in place, we would need your cooperation in a manner that, that uh, is positive. Brian? No. Uh, Madam Reeve, and uh, my question is also for Todd. And if Jeff, you need to um, uh, provide some additional, that's great too. So just so I have an idea about the scale of this, how many megawatts um, from J would, would, would be required to supply the JBS plant? So that's, I have, I have a few questions. So that's number yep. one. The second one is, um, 
uh, when it comes to the transportation of the CO2, um, you mentioned Methanex. Um, how does that affect the scale of the business model as far as the as uh, having to transport the, that product to, to Medicine Hat for Methanex? And my third question is similar to Anne Marie's. And when you asked for a letter of support and you mentioned the ERA, um, so are you asking for uh, um, a component of funding from the Alberta government that would be viewed as a subsidy and support for us to do that. This is all CapEx is what the ERA request is, Brian. Um, back up to your first question, uh, JBS needs eight to nine sustainable megawatts of, of energy and they have a peak demand of 12. Uh, our proposal is we're going to build 20 megawatts of energy to start. Uh, given the the energy availability from Torxon, we could actually expand that to 40 megawatts. Uh, but th there is some rules within uh, grid connections that we need to be very mindful of in terms of scaling the project. Uh, we would start at the 20 and, and we would have vision to expand to the 40. Brian, would it, I, I, I may have uh, misstated in terms of the use of the CO2. We believe that we can consume all of the CO2 on site between JBS's requirements for food grade CO2 and dry ice. And there's a number of these participants that we've already had commercial conversations with that are interested in, in setting up uh, at this industrial park, if we can put it together. Methanex is, a, is probably number three or four on the list, but it is a fallback position to ensure that we are in fact an emissionless um, carbon-free park. Uh, as per our our uh, our goals, I hope that's clear, Brian. Yeah, thank you. I guess maybe just I, I I sort of need a yes and no answer as far as the subsidy, the letter to support this project. Is that a subsidy that you're applying for, or government funding to support this project? It, the the government uh, request is for funding to help support our capex development. So it would go towards the development of the CO2 capture skid, uh, any secondary uh, components that would need to go around that, together with the power plant. Can, so I, right can now, I maybe yeah. add a little bit to that, Todd, for you? Thanks. Um, we were talking about carbon taxes before, and what, what happens with the federal government when they capture when they capture the carbon taxes? Is they recycle them back to the provinces? And then the provinces has have money then that they can exp, uh, spend on anything to do with emissions reduction. So there's a fund, the ERA fund is this carbon tax money, and then it would go follow back. And it, the idea is is that it's to encourage business to reduce their emissions, and they provide up to 50% of the cost of those emissions. So it is a recycling of the carbon tax. Thank you for clearing that up. That was very helpful. Okay. Other questions? Clarence. Can we expect um, requests to buy some of that land from us and how much in, in the very near future? Is that something that we should be expecting? Well, we, we'd ask you folks to consider it, Clarence. I mean, we, we hope to bring a significant opportunity to the community with new investment, new employment, new industry. And uh, we, we'd ask you folks to treat it accordingly. What we need from yep. you is we need, we need a proposal in terms of, of uh, what are the commercial terms associated with that land? Are you prepared to give it to us under long-term lease? Are you prepared to sell it? Are you prepared to give it to us? Uh, we believe that you could, in fact, uh, acquire significant funding for the civil development uh, by an ask. I mean, th this is some of the things that, that uh, you know, you folks need to decide, hence the presentation to the Board of Directors today. But we need to understand what this is so we can put it into our, our uh, cost estimations on the total installed cost of this project ultimately distilling it into a cost per kilowatt produced ABS and for the participants that would come to the park.
Other questions? No. There was a mention of uh, transportation routes uh, and roads. Jeff, you are familiar with the accesses and uh, if we're looking at, I, I mean, Todd, you re reference the roads as well. So that would be part of your ask also. Yes, Molly. And Todd, Jeff, you know about all of that, correct? Jeff Tiffin, that is? I'd say no. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. That was uh, confusing there for a second, Molly. Um, <laughs> yeah, as previously discussed with uh, Todd uh, Beasley here uh, over the past couple of weeks, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting project. Uh, I, I mean, the, the development of what uh, has been explained, I, I think, uh, uh, makes sense on paper, makes sense from a high level. I, I think uh, that parcel of the counties uh, for everybody's information is uh, are, are where we used to have our calcium storage tanks located beside Volker. They've since been removed and we've cleaned up the, the parcel uh, and it sits. It was recently used by AECON as a laydown site for the Highway 1 uh, uh, overlay job. Um, the, the interesting part about this is, is uh, I, I can't really define what uh, we're going to need in terms of transportation routes and, and upgrades and everything else for a couple of reasons. Um, understanding the traffic patterns to and from the development is going to be huge and, and understanding what's coming and going in a day um, to, you know, dictate what, what is actually needed. On top of that, somebody uh, who are adjacent to Alberta Transportation and access to Highway 1 are, are also going to provide uh, comments and, and uh, you know, their reaction to, to this development happening uh, immediately adjacent to the highway, you know, direct access within a half a mile to, to the highway. So to, to, to say what the, the comments back from that, uh, that department and that level is going to be and what that's going to dictate is actually necessary necessary is kind of a bit of an unknown at this time. So has there been any uh, looking into that, uh, Bod Beasley? Yeah. Molly, I've, I've been through this before. I, I developed another facility just across from Tillybrook and, and uh, you know, as long as we don't have any, and, and we're in behind the transportation Volker Stevens sheds. So as long as we're not impacting the highway from a visual perspective, we're not having any, any billboards out there where we're not going to be having any extraordinary lights that, that could be considered harmful. I, I've, it's been my experience that they've been pretty positive and they certainly want to help say yes to industry that wants to, to uh, be in close proximity to a highway. Uh, we just got to make sure all the boxes are are checked, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. But I do not expect significant pushback or opposition from uh, Alberta Transportation. And again, we we uh, there isn't really any other surrounding landowners and occupants out there that are within close enough proximity that that would say or have opposition to the project. And and what we're talking about is engines. And right next door at the Torxon location. Uh, they've got a half a dozen engines that are currently running, uh, which are exactly what we're going to, to put in. But the difference is, is that we're capturing the emissions and by extension, we're capturing the sound that would come out of those engines. So our oper operation would actually be very quiet relative to even Torxon. So we, we think it's positive. Uh, the request will be positive from Alberta Transportation. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, there may be once we get further into discussion. So I know that uh, our Jeff has contacts, uh, contact info for, for the other Jeff and for Todd. So seeing no other question, hands up at the present moment. Thank you. Jeff Allison and Todd Beasley for presenting today. And obviously uh, we can be in touch. Thanks so much, folks. Thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to hearing from you in the near future.
Thank you. So, Bye Council, bye-bye. Council, we have a one o'clock uh, delegation, so we will um, recess until then. Thank you.